welcome to Fully Charged. Now, if this series achieves nothing else, I really hope that it's, it's helping to map out and uh, record some of the incredible changes that are taking place. Now, we'll soon be releasing the talks that we recorded at Fully Charged Live a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're in the middle of editing them. There's 18 of them in all. So we're going to release them in sort of playlists so that you don't get bombarded all at once, but you can kind of watch them if and when you want to. Now, Johnny Smith and cameraman Mark are currently in Colorado and they're recording a rather fast electric vehicle on a mountain. I won't say any more. And they're also getting a test drive in a vehicle that we can't get in the UK quite yet. So that's going to be very exciting. I've just been to a big offshore wind power conference in Manchester and I had a glimpse into a kind of a world that most of us don't really see very much of. Unless you work in the offshore wind industry, you're not going to know much about it because it takes place offshore. We don't really see it that much. But let me tell you, this is a huge industry that is growing at a truly unprecedented rate. Offshore wind is an often ignored success story in the UK. I mean, we regularly get up to 40% of our electricity from offshore wind, and very few people know that. It's also developing very fast. There are massive plans for just truly colossal wind farms on Dogger Bank in the North Sea. So way, way out to sea. You won't be able to see them from land at all. And these are truly enormous installations and they're putting in the biggest wind turbines in the world. The wind turbines they're currently building will be 12 megawatt units. Now, just to put that into some sort of scale and perspective we might be able to understand, if you are driving along a motorway or you live near a wind farm in the UK on land, most of those big wind turbines you see on the tops of hills are between two and at the most maybe four megawatts. And what they're installing out at sea is 12 megawatts. Now, the big blades that turn around on those big wind turbines on land, some of those are between 20 up to maybe 50 meters in length, each, each individual blade. The blade that I saw at this exhibition is 107 meters long. One blade, 107 meters long. It is so huge. But here's a quick explanation that I now understand as to why the wind industry are trying to get bigger and bigger wind turbines. So you, if you've got, uh, say, six two megawatt wind turbines out at sea, that's an enormous cost of installation and an enormous cost for maintenance. And that can be replaced with one single turbine that produces the same amount of electricity, which needs far less installation and far less maintenance. Therefore, it's cheaper. That's why offshore wind is getting cheaper and cheaper. The bigger the, the turbines, the cheaper the electricity. It's quite simple maths, really. But it's not just the size of these individual turbines, it's the speed they're being developed that is really impressive. It took 20 years for the offshore wind industry to install the first 17 gigawatts of offshore generating capacity. They are now installing over 10 gigawatts of new capacity each year and the cost per kilowatt hour continues to fall. Wind power is cheaper than any other form of generating electricity. And before you start ranting about subsidised offshore wind, the subsidies that go to the burning of fossil fuels and nuclear energy are far, far greater. I mean, to an extent it's hard to imagine than anything that the wind industry gets. And also, one of the most exciting talks that, was, that took place there was about how the wind industry continues on zero subsidies. They, they will require zero subsidies in the next couple of years. Wind turbines make money for the people who put them in. That's why they're investing hundreds of billions of dollars around the world in offshore wind. So the economies of scale are really kicking in and this is a vibrant and rapidly growing industrial sector that has already created tens of thousands of actual jobs. And talking of taxpayer subsidies, there is a flip side to this success story, and that is the decommissioning of North Sea oil and gas. It is, well, it's quite expensive. The original government estimate of £39 billion pounds to decommission all the stuff we stuck out in the sea to take gas and oil out of the North Sea has just risen. What a surprise! To £80 billion. Pounds. I want you to remember this little fact the next time your uncle gets all huffy about renewable energy subsidies. We, the poor duped put-upon taxpayer, will have to pay to decommission this huge amount of now completely useless infrastructure. 
Well, the oil and gas companies are not going to pay for it. I mean, they're not stupid, are they? For goodness sake. No, no, they never pay to clean up their own mess. So just get over it, you greeny, virtue-signalling softies. We'll have to pay for it, and our children will have to pay for it, and our children's children will have to pay for it. Lovely. But that's too depressing. Here's a quirky electric vehicle story to cheer you up. Sea Bubbles. It's such a cute name. It's a hydrofoil water taxi built in France and recently tested on Lake Geneva. It has a 20 kilowatt hour battery and can cruise around for about an hour on a charge. But during that hour, because it's up on legs with very little water resistance, it's fast and doesn't create huge waves. Nice. And now rubbish. Trash. Garbage. Landfill. Plastic islands in the Pacific. Sorry, sorry, no, I was, I'm trying to be positive. Trash trucks, well, dustbin lorries as we call them in the UK rather cutely, uh, by their very nature have to go everywhere to do the job they need to do. So normally you wouldn't get big trucks driving down, say, small city streets or, or uh, suburban avenues or somewhere like that. You know, they, they wouldn't go there, but a, a, a dustbin lorry, as I want to call it, has to go everywhere. It has to go everywhere where people live. And of course, at the moment, they're all dirty, noisy diesels and they make a hell of a racket. Well, the City of London have just introduced the first all-electric refuse collection vehicle, an electric RCV. It can complete a full 10-hour shift on one charge and it can carry 10 tonnes of our guilt, I mean, sorry, our rubbish that we just throw away. The battery packs not only power the vehicle to make it move along the road, they also uh, power the compactors and the bin lifters at the back and everything. Everything's run by electric. It's much quieter. It's much more efficient. It uses less energy to do the same uh, route that a diesel one that will do. And it requires a huge amount less maintenance, which means it's cheaper to run. What a surprise. It's just another example that the changes we're seeing are only going to accelerate. And finally, the folks at Volkswagen, well, the nice ones. It's most of them. Most of them are nice. There's only a few that were slightly law-breaking. We'll forget them. The nice ones are spending money like it's literally going out of style. They've just paid $100 million to acquire a company called QuantumScape. It's a really good name, isn't it? QuantumScape are a solid-state battery manufacturing company that are, uh, have been developed out of various universities in the United States. And they're called QuantumScape. <laughs> Mr. Bond, we require you to go into QuantumScape and kill them. It's just one of those names, isn't it? QuantumScape could be a title of a James Bond movie. I'm moving on, moving on. As a VW spokesman said in a recent press release, a solid state battery potentially increases the range of an e-golf to approximately 750 meters from the current to meters. That would be a really small battery. What's the range on your e-golf? It's 750 meters. Sorry. The range would be increased to 750 kilometers from the current 300 kilometers. Solid state batteries are theoretically smaller, lighter, more energy dense, can be charged more often and last longer and uh, are much safer than current lithium ion technology. So the list of advantages goes on and on, but this is still kind of theoretical. You know, it's still in development, but many other companies are also investing a lot of money in this, including Hyundai, BMW and Toyota. I don't think we're going to be buying uh, cars with solid state batteries for a few years, but I think this is a very good sign because even a company that has a little bit of a checkered history recently, like Volkswagen, they're not going to be spending a hundred million dollars on some pipe dream possible it might work battery technology. They clearly know that this stuff works. Anyway, that's all I've got time for. There's loads and loads of brilliant episodes coming up on Fully Charged soon, so do stay tuned. I just want to thank a handful of Patreon supporters who donate $10 a month or more that help keep this series going. It's really, really amazing that you do it. There is quite a long list. I'm going to get through it if it's the last thing I do. But here they are. Charles Haworth, Justin Hendricks, Norman Uppard, Mike Ward, Kate Doyle and Mitch Siepke, Tom Pakenham, Jai Geng Lee, Tom De Simone, Quarantine Hat, Loco Sicek. Well, that's it. Please subscribe to Fully Charged. Please have a look at the little Patreon link beneath this. Please click the little bell so you get uh, announcements when we put up new episodes. And as always, if you have been, thank you for watching. <laughs>